Hi, so I'm Kira, and I recently made a video about how to smash your Oxford or Cambridge interview and had some really lovely feedback from that um, but also had quite a few messages from people asking me if I would be able to make a video specifically about uh, psychology interviews um, because I did my Masters in Psychological Research at the University of Oxford and before that I did my undergraduate degree in Psychological and Behavioural Sciences at Cambridge. So I have experience interviewing for psychology at both of these places. So I'm just going to briefly take you guys through five different types of questions they might ask you in your psychology interview and the approach I would take to answering these. So the first type of question I wanted to discuss is where the interviewer asks you to link an area of your knowledge to a broader theme in psychological research. So they may hone in on a certain experience or a certain interest you've mentioned in your personal statement and ask you to reflect on how your broader knowledge of psychology has influenced either your understanding of this or your behaviour in a certain scenario. So to give a concrete example, I did a lot of tutoring before applying to university and this was something that I discussed in my personal statement. And in my interview, they asked me how my knowledge of psychology had informed my approach to tutoring. Um, things that I would say you need to make sure you're doing, use some concrete examples if you can refer to some specific researchers or specific papers or theories when you're giving your answer, it demonstrates really clearly to the interviewer that you have very subject specific knowledge um, rather than just sort of making vague statements. And it's even better if you can discuss something that goes beyond, you know, just the A-level syllabus. So to tell you guys how I answered this question. Um, I discussed how my knowledge of research into memory had informed my teaching methods for the children that I tutored. So as well as discussing for a little bit um, certain theories of memory retention that I'd come across in my class, I also went further and explained how, you know, I'd done a bit of extra reading outside of class and I had found you know, some research into other alternative memory retention techniques and that I had taught these to my students and it had helped them to remember the material that I was teaching. So you can see there how I've sort of really explicitly linked my behaviour to certain academic papers. So the second type of question I wanted to talk about is when the interviewer will ask you about your understanding of a certain key debate in psychology. And I'm going to use a very specific example here because it came up in both my Cambridge and my Oxford interviews and it's also been so drilled into my brain throughout the four years of studying psychology and that is the nature versus nurture debate. Now what is the nature versus nurture debate? Well the nature side of the debate suggests that certain phenomena can be explained by innate features of humans. So for example, things that they are born with that are not then changed throughout an individual's lifespan. So this can be their genetics, their brain structure, or certain evolved traits that are said to influence, you know, all humans' behaviour in the same way. The nurture approach can be seen as the polar opposite to this, and it's looking at how certain external factors can influence an individual's behaviour or cognitions or anything really. So for example this may look at the effects of socialisation, it may look at the effects of an individual's diet throughout their life or exposure to certain drugs, anything like that that they are not born with. This debate is really pervasive through all different um, branches of psychology um, but there is something really, really important that I want to point out about this, and this is, whereas in the past people took really strong perspectives, you know, this is all caused by nature, this is all caused by nurture, no one really takes that approach anymore. The nature versus nurture debate is largely quite dead, um, because researchers are increasingly recognising that you cannot disambiguate the two. Um, they are 
constantly having bi-directional influences on each other. So for example, if someone were to find that genetics cause a certain disorder, would that be entirely nature? Well, no, because nurture and our external environment can influence the genes that we express through a process called epigenetics. And even if you link a certain region in the brain and sort of aberrant connectivity there, again, to another disorder, does that mean it's all nature? Well, no, we've increasingly recognised that the brain constantly changes throughout the life through a process called neuroplasticity. So again, nurture has an influence on nature. And looking at the reverse of that, an individual's genetics may predispose them to certain uh, personality types that mean they're more likely to be involved in certain situations. For example, if someone's genes mean that they are more open to new experiences and more risk-seeking, um, then they may be put in environments that then influence the nurture side of things a bit more. So yes, the two, nature and nurture, massively interact with each other. So I think that's really important to highlight if they ask you, you know, your stance on the nature versus nurture debate for a certain phenomena is really important to highlight. Well, actually, I don't take either approach. Both of them have an influence and both of them influence each other. So the third type of question I wanted to talk about was critical research evaluation. And this question can typically take two forms. So sometimes they ask you to design a study. So they'll give you a research question and then they will ask you, you know, how might you investigate this? And it's important to really justify your thought process for every decision you make. So say, for example, you think a questionnaire design would be best to investigate this. Why is that? What are the advantages of a questionnaire design? Why is it better than other methods? What limitations are there that you would need to address and how would you address this? The other type of question they might ask you for this research evaluation theme is to evaluate someone else's research design. And this means both looking at the strengths and the weaknesses of that study. So some things to consider when you're doing this, um, how reliable does the study appear to be? Um, and that basically means if someone else were to replicate the experiment in the same way, how likely is it that they would garner the same results? Um, it's also important to consider validity. So to what degree is the study measuring the thing that it intended to study? And for this, you'll wanna look at the specific measures used, how well validated they are. It's also important to consider the generalizability of the conclusions of the study. So you want to make sure that the sample they've used is fit for the aims of the study. If they're looking to make really general, broad conclusions, then it needs to be a large sample size encompassing a range of different demographics. If they're only looking to draw conclusions to a certain population, um, then the sample they've used should be reflective of that. And certain characteristics you may want to consider of the sample include the age, the gender, um, where the sample are from, you know, the country in which the study is being conducted, and things like that. The sample size also needs to be appropriate for the aims of the study. So if it's just a case study, then of course it's fine to just have one or a couple of participants. If you're looking at a study that, again, is trying to make really broad general conclusions, you need a larger sample size. The next type of question I wanted to discuss is where they'll ask you to interpret data. And again, this can take two forms. So the first form is where they'll literally give you a graph or a table or some kind of visual representation of data, and they'll ask you to interpret what it's showing. There's a certain few steps that I always go through when approached with a question like this. So first of all, I want to give a brief sentence summary of what it is that the data intends to show. And there's typically a big clue for this in that there will be a title 
that gives away what the aims um, of that graph or whatever it is are. Um, so I'll just reword this and I normally refer to the axes labels as well if it's a graph um, just to be really clear about what it is that's being mapped against what. Um, and then I'll move to a more general overview of the trends in the data, making sure to use my key terms uh, like positive correlation, negative correlation, nonlinear relationship, etc, etc. Um, and then I'm going to point out specific parts of the data, certain figures, if I'm looking at a table, certain numbers, to illustrate what I've said and to highlight that relationship. So for example, if I was looking at a line graph, I might say, you know, an increase in blah blah in the x-axis subsequently resulted in an increase in blah blah in the y-axis. Um, when I'm referring to these specific data points as well, I might want to highlight certain anomalies in the data, so certain points that don't fit the trend. Then at the end, I'm going to want to summarise everything I've just discussed and also maybe link that back to certain theories or papers that I've read in the past. The other form this question can take is that they will give you certain finding or certain research question and they will ask you how you would represent this visually um, and for this it's really important to think about what type of variables you're looking at so if you're looking at the effects of certain membership to certain categories on a continuous variable that would be probably a bar chart if you're looking at the prevalence of certain categories, that would probably be a pie chart. If you're looking at frequency across something continuous, that would be a histogram. And if you're looking at the effects of two continuous variables on each other, that would be a line chart. So yeah, just take a second to think about how you'd best display this. And as you're drawing up, talk them through your thought process, you know, explain what you're doing. The last type of question that I'm going to talk about today are the total surprise questions. Now, there is absolutely no way you're going to be able to prepare for these. Um, and that's kind of the point of them. They might not even be psychology related. They might be completely out the blue and they're kind of designed just to shock you a bit, make you panic a little bit and see how you respond um, to something a little bit unpredictable. Um, obviously the biggest tip here, remain calm, don't freak out, um, take some time to think about what it is they're asking, feel free to ask them to clarify what they mean by certain terms, and yeah, just make sure you really understand the question first and foremost. When you feel ready, start talking through your thought process. If it's something you're not completely sure about, that's fine. Um, but what they want to gain is an understanding of how your brain works. When I did my interview, they asked me how a toothpaste worked um, because I mentioned that I had done a little bit of work experience in a lab that produced toothpaste. And I was so thrown off guard. I had done so much research into like psychology theories. I remember just sitting there after they asked this, like, what, why, why are they asking me this? This is nothing to do with psychology. Um, but I didn't panic. Um, I just took a few seconds, took a glass of water, um, and then began talking them through my answer. So I hope these tips helped you all. Um, feel free to message me if you have any more questions about that and best of luck with your interviews.